So, okay, so in these lectures, uh, I want to speak about uh, mainly the topic would be uh, minimal surfaces. So, you can have several interests to look at uh, these objects. Uh, first, uh, because you have some beautiful picture in mind and you want to understand the geometry of uh, these minimal surfaces. But there is also, uh, you can also understand them as a tool to understand the geometry and the topology of three manifolds, if you look only to surfaces or to higher dimension manifolds. And uh, there is also an interest in understanding the, the geometry of this object because there is a link. Uh, it could help to have some intuition on some PDE problem also. Uh, but I, I won't speak about this uh, in these lectures. So mainly the, it's not the, a plan of, the, of these lectures, but the f first I will begin with uh, some definition and property. So today I will mainly do this. Tomorrow I will speak uh, about uh, some stability issue. And uh, we will see wh what I mean by this. And uh, after that, uh, I will speak about some existence results. And uh, at the end, uh, it depends on the time. I don't know exactly uh, where I will go uh, with this. Uh, I will speak about uh, minimal surfaces. In the unit three sphere. And uh, say something about this. The idea is that uh, is to go as far as possible in order to have uh, to know something in order to uh, be able to understand the proof of the Wilmore conjecture by Mar Marquez and Neves. I won't speak about this. But uh, with this in mind, you will be able to understand the, uh, the main idea of the proof and maybe uh, understand the proof. OK, so today I want to speak about uh, some definitions. And in fact, I begin by uh, first one, uh, minimal submanifold. So the thing is that, uh, in general, what I, I have in, in to consider is first some Riemannian manifold. And inside it, I look at some submanifold of dimension k. So it, in general, I, you can think about an immersed submanifold. OK, so I have to fix some notation I will use uh, next in, the, in these lectures. So in general, I will uh, use the following notation for the connection on M. So this is on M. Uh, I will use uh, Nabla for the connection on sigma. And it is well known that uh, these two objects are related by the following relation. If uh, x and y are a uh, tangent field to uh, sigma, then uh, nabla xy is just the tangential part, uh, tangential part of this quantity. And uh, you have a well-known definition also, which is uh, uh, what is the, so this is the tangential part of this quantity, but what is the normal part of this? So the normal part of this. It is what is called the second fundamental form of sigma. It's a symmetric bilinear form with value in the normal uh, vector, uh, in, the, in normal vector fields to uh, sigma. So the second fundamental form. OK, and uh, there is a, one important definition now is uh, the mean curvature vector uh, 
which is just the trace of the second fundamental form. Uh, not exactly the trace, so it's h. And I put here an arrow in order to remark that it is a vector, which is, so you take the trace of the second fundamental form. So this is the trace on sigma. And uh, this is, since it's the mean curvature, uh, you put a 1 over k in front of it. So it depends where you read this. Sometimes you don't have this term in front of it. It changes a bit the notation. But uh, my convention is uh, you put a 1 over k in front of it. OK. Uh, and also, one remark also. So I said that uh, when the amiant manifold is m, I use this uh, to, know the, to denote the, the connection. In fact, when the amiant manifold, when m, is in fact Rn, uh, I will use uh, D as the connection. Because sometimes I will have uh, uh, Rn inside it, uh, some manifold M, and inside it, some surface sigma. So I need uh, the three uh, notation. OK. OK, so this is the basic notation I will use. And so now let me come back to the the main topic, so minimal submanifolds. OK. So the first thing is that uh, something that you can compute when you have some sigma. So, the, so the volume of sigma, and I will denote this by sigma between uh, two bars, like this, in the following, is just the integral of the constant function 1 on sigma for the volume element on sigma. OK, and uh, since uh, in the following, I will mainly focus on the case where k is equal to 2, I will speak about the area of sigma. OK, so you have this. And what is the informal uh, definition of minimal submanifold. It's just the fact that sigma is a minimal submanifold if it's a critical point of this functional. So sigma is minimal if uh, sigma is a critical point of uh, the area function. OK. So let me uh, make some remarks for the moment. I, don't, I, I do not have made any hypothesis on sigma, so it's a smooth submanifold, of course. But uh, it could be uh, non-compact. So this quantity could be uh, uh, infinity, the infinity. And so what is a critical point in that uh, sense? Uh, maybe there is some boundary, what I made about uh, this boundary. OK, it's not clear at all for the moment what is, this, what is exactly this. So let me fix now the, the thing. So it's given by uh, some computation. So the idea is that I look at a, a family, C sub T, of immersion of my uh, sigma inside the manifold M. So it's a family of immersion, a smooth family of immersion. And basically, I can assume that uh, this is equal to some constant. That, uh, in fact, I assume that C sub t is equal to C sub C naught outside some compact subset 
in sigma. And on the boundary of sigma. OK. So the idea is that I, I want to deform sigma, but just on a compact part. And I want now to write down what is to be a critical point for the area function. So the thing is that uh, I can look at g sub t, which is just the pullback of the metric of the ambient uh, Riemannian manifold m. So this gives me a metric on sigma. And I can compute, look at the area of sigma sub t, which is just the image of sigma by uh, psi of t, psi t, which is just the integral of the volume element of the, uh, for the metric gt. And the thing, OK. It could still be a plus infinity. But the idea is that uh, since I want to deform only on a compact part, I can do the integration only on that compact part and look at what happened there. OK, uh, so what is uh, how you compute this? One computation that you can make is the following. So I write down the same expression, but now what I change in this is that I use the fact that uh, I can make a change of coordinate there and write this as the determinant of the metric gt in the metric g0 to uh, one half times the volume element of g0. So this is just the Jacobian of the uh, transformation that makes the metric change from G0 to GT. And uh, so the, the area is changed like this. OK. So now I want to compute the derivative of this. So what I want to compute is the derivative of this quantity. And look uh, at what happened. So I fix, so fix uh, fi for i between 1 and k an orthonormal frame on sigma. And since I look at uh, an orthonormal frame, I have to fix some metric on sigma. So the metric I want to look at is G0. So the determinant in G0 of the metric GT, what it is, it's just the determinant of the metric uh, Fi, Fj, Ij between 1 and k. And uh, another way to write this is just the determinant of G0 d psi t, psi t fi, d psi t fj. OK? OK. So the thing now is that I want to compute the derivative of this quantity. So this is the derivative of some determinant. And at t is equal to 0, uh, this vector is just uh, f uh, fi, this vector is just fj. So this is an orthonormal basis. So at the t is equal to 0, this matrix is just the identity. So this is the derivative of the determinant at the identity. So it's the trace. OK? So if, if I compute the derivative of this at t is equal to 0, what I get is just the trace of the derivative of the matrix so it's the sum 
on i of this quantity. OK, so now I can compute this derivative. It's just twice, uh, so it's the sum on i twice g naught d over dt. So this is this quantity. D psi t, uh, it's not ei, it's fi, fi. fi, and that t is equal to 0. This quantity is just fi, so it's fi. And this is this at t is equal to 0. OK. Uh, so let me erase this part. OK, so you have this. The thing is that uh, this quantity is just, in some sense, the derivative of ct in the direction fi. So I can make the, uh, I can exchange the two derivatives there. And so what I get is that the derivative of the determinant in g0 of gt it's just twice the sum on i of nabla bar fi x fi, where x is just uh, d over dt of psi t. So psi t is just uh, an immersion, and this quantity is just tells you, uh, of course, that t is equal to 0, tells you in which direction you are deforming the surface at t is equal to 0. OK, so you have this. And the thing is that now you can split this expression in two parts concerning, OK, uh, I can look at x. It could be orthogonal to uh, sigma at time t is equal to 0. It could be tangent. So I decompose this in two terms. So first, there is a term uh, of the, uh, the, the orthonormal part, fi, plus exactly the same term, but for the tangential part. So the second term is just the divergence along sigma of the tangential part. So twice the divergence on sigma of the tangential part. The other term there uh, so there is a nabla bar there, sorry. So uh, you can exchange the derivative there between this term and this term. And using the fact that this is orthogonal to sigma, this is tangent to sigma. So the scalar product of these two terms is equal to 0 along sigma. So this is just minus twice the sum on i, this. And this. OK? And what I see there, the scalar product of this vector with this one, which is orthogonal, is just the scalar product of the orthogonal part of this term. And since I sum on i, what I get is the mean curvature. So what I get is minus 2k h plus twice the divergence on sigma of this. OK.
So now I can finish the computation of the derivative of the volume. What I get at the end is that the derivative with respect to t of the volume of sigma sub t at t is equal to 0 is just the integral over sigma of the derivative of this quantity. So there is a 1 over 2 there that goes out. Here there is the 2, so you have a sim some simplification. And what you get is just minus k h uh, plus the divergence on sigma of the tangential part, d vol on sigma naught. So you have this expression. But now let me recall, remind, uh, recall you that uh, I made some hypothesis on psi t, the fact that it moves only a compact part of the, uh, the hypersurface of the submanifold. So uh, you can apply the Stokes theorem in order to remove this term because on the boundary, uh, this quantity is equal to 0. So you get only this expression. OK. So in fact, when you look at these two terms, because sometimes you have to take care of the fact that x, uh, the tangential part of x is not equal to 0 on the boundary of sigma, so you have some extra term. But the idea is that this term comes from the fact that, in fact, you are moving the surface, the, the submanifold tangent to it. So it's just a reparametrization of the submanifold. It does not change the area in some sense. And that's why this term disappears at the end of the computation. This term tells you how you change the area when you deform it on the uh, normal part, in the normal direction. OK. So now, what is the fact that being minimal? Being minimal, it tells you, OK, this quantity has to be 0 for any deformation. So for any x, this quantity has to be 0. So you have to assume that the min curvature vector is equal to 0 along sigma. So the definition now of a minimal submanifold is Minimal submanifold is a submanifold. Submanifold with vanishing mean curvature. So H. is equal to 0 along sigma. So this is the definition I will use now in the following of the lecture. And in fact, if you put uh, k equal to 1 in this definition, so in fact, you are looking at a curve in so inside some Riemannian manifold. The area is just the length. And this equality there is just the, the equation of a geodesic curve. So uh, yesterday, uh, we have seen the definition of a geodesic. And in fact, uh, uh, the computation was not made. But uh, this is exactly the computation, the computation that you can, made, uh, you can make in order to prove it. OK. OK, so some examples. So the first thing is that uh, H is just the trace of the second fundamental form. So in order to the, for the trace to be equal to 0, you can, uh, for example, assume that the second fundamental form is equal to 0. So the first example is uh, totally 
géodésique submanifold. So for example, uh, you can look at uh, some R2, uh, affine R2 inside R3, a plane. So it's totally geodesic, so it's minimal. Uh, you can think about uh, uh, equator, uh, the equator in uh, SN. So you look at the round sphere, with the, the round metric, and you look at the equator inside it. So it's uh, totally geodesic, so it's minimal. Uh, you can also think about the case where, uh, so in R3, you have two basic examples, uh, except R2, which are the catenoid. So what is the catenoid? Uh, you take uh, some vertical axis, and then you take a plane that contains this, this axis, and you draw the graph. So here it's a Z. In this direction, it's X. And here, this curve is just the graph of the cosinus, uh, the hyperbolic cosinus. So X is just cos uh, of Z. So this is a curve. And now you make this curve turn around the vertical axis. So you get a, a surface of revolution, and which is minimal. You make this turn around the vertical axis. And this is minimal. OK. Uh, some other examples. Okay, other example, the helicoid. So what is the idea? Uh, you, take, you still take a vertical axis, and you take an horizontal line that cross the vertical axis orthogonally there. And you make this line uh, go up, goes up, but turning at a constant speed. So we Make this, this, then uh, there it's like this. So it turns like this when you go up. Okay, it's uh, hard to make a good picture of this, uh, but uh, okay. So this is minimal also. And if you try to find uh, some other examples uh, in uh, R3, except the plane catenoid and helicoid, it's not so easy to find good examples. But there is a, a lot of them. OK, uh, another example that you can think about is the following. So it's a minimal surface in the unit three sphere. So I look at the F3 inside R4. OK, and I split R4 as the orthogonal sum of R2 with R2. OK? So, uh, or the orthogonal product, maybe. Better like this. OK, so inside uh, this R2, you look at the circle centered at the origin of radius 1 over the square root of 2. So, inside this, you have a, uni you have a, a circle of radius 1 over the square root of 2. Inside this, you have also this. Unit circle, uh, not unit circle, but circle of radius 1 over the square root of 2. And you take the product of these two. So this is a surface, it's a torus inside R4. But in fact, because of the choice of the 1 over the square root of 2 and 1 over the square root of 2, it's inside the unit 3 sphere. Okay? 
And this is minimal. So this is the Clifford torus. And uh, it is minimal. OK. So now, uh, as it is, it seems to be good to give some exercise. So, exercise. Uh, prove that catenoid, helicoid, and uh, Clifford torus uh, are minimal. Uh. Uh, just one precision it is minimal in the unit three sphere, not in R2. Not in R4. If you change the ambient space, you ch uh, the, the surface could be not anymore uh, uh, minimal. OK, so this is the first uh, exercise. There is another one that could be interesting also, which is the following. So you take, a, let sigma be a submanifold. in the unit sphere. And you see this uh, inside uh, Rn plus 1. So one thing that you can do is to look at the cone over sigma in Rn plus 1. So let uh, C sigma be the set of points of the form Tp, where T is in R plus star and P is in sigma. So this is a cone. And the question is the following. Prove that sigma is minimal in Sn. It's equivalent to the fact that C sigma is minimal in Rn plus 1. So you have a way to rely a minimal submanifold in the unit sphere to minimal submanifold in Rn plus 1, just by looking at the cone over sigma. OK. So of course. Uh, this, uh, this surface has, uh, in some sense, some singularity at the origin. Uh, and uh, the question to understand this singularity is a, is a big issue in the regularity theory of minimal submanifolds. OK. So what is the main result of today? It's the following one which is, the, in some sense, the first basic tool in minimal surface theory, which is the monotonicity formula. So first, I will give you the version in the Euclidean space. So let sigma k inside Rn be a minimal submanifold. Uh, so I will assume that it is compact, maybe with boundary. I will take a point in Rn. And uh, I will make some assumption. Uh, I will, OK, uh, I choose some R positive, such that uh, the boundary of sigma 
is outside the ball of radius r centered at p, like this. OK, so what is the monotonicity formula? It's the following. For any, so for any s and t, uh, so I have to assume, so s is less than t. So for any s and t like this, if you look at the volume of sigma inside the ball, centered at p of radius t. And you divide this by t to the k minus the volume of sigma inside the ball of radius s centered at p divided by s to the k. This is equal to the integral over sigma inside uh, the ball of uh, radius t mi minus the ball of radius s. So I remove the center, but it's always p. Of the following quantity, so x minus p, and you look at the orthogonal part to sigma, square divided by uh, the norm of x minus p to the k minus uh, uh, plus 2 uh, times the volume uh, on sigma. OK. So the, uh, the, uh, the idea is that you can compare. So you have uh, your submanifolds uh, inside your ambient manifold, uh, inside Rn. You have a point p somewhere. You look at the quantity of sigma inside the ball of radius uh, s, and you want to compare it with the quantity of of the uh, you want to compare it with the volume of sigma inside the ball of radius t. Okay. And the thing is that uh, you have to divide by some power of uh, the radius in order to have something which is a scale invariant. Because uh, one thing that I do not mention is the following. Uh, if you have uh, some minimal submanifold inside Rn, and you make some homotety of Rn, you still have a, a minimal submanifold. So being minimal is invariant by homotety. And this quantity there is invariant by homotety. So you have this. OK, and so you have a good expression of the difference of these two terms. And why it is called the monotonicity formula? It's because this quantity is positive and non-negative. So, so what you see is that the ratio of the volume inside the ball of radius t is a non-decreasing function of t. OK. So I will prove this, but uh, before I want to make some remark and comment. So it's time to make this. <coughs> uh, of course, in the formula, x is the point on sigma. OK, so some comment and remark. 
So the first one is uh, just what I've said uh, just before, is that the quantity theta p of r, which is so the volume of sigma inside the ball uh, of radius r and center that p divided by r to the k. And in fact, in order to have something which is uh, more convenient for the following, I divide not by r to the k, but by the volume of the ball of radius r in the Euclidean space. So this is just the volume of the ball of radius 1 in the Euclidean space of dimension k. Is non-decreasing. And this quantity is called the density of sigma inside the ball of radius r and centered at p. OK. So assume uh, one consequence of this is the following. Assume that sigma is compact with no boundary. And look at the limit of this density when r goes to plus infinity. So if r is sufficiently large, this volume is just the volume of sigma, which is finite. And you divide by something that goes to plus infinity. So the limit is just 0. So it tells me that the density is always equal to 0 for any r. So the consequence is sigma is empty. So there is no compact su minimal submanifold in Rn with no boundary. Okay. Uh, the other important remark is the following: if This quantity, so it's non-decreasing, but assume it is constant. <coughs> so the consequence of this is that in the monotonicity formula, uh, the right-hand side term is equal to 0. So it tells you that the orthogonal part of x minus p is equal to 0 for any x on sigma. And if you think a bit about uh, this, what you see is that, in fact, sigma is a cone centered at p, with p, some ver uh, with p the vertex of sigma. Uh, so sigma is a cone with vertex uh, at p. OK. OK. Uh, now assume that uh, you choose P, you choose it on sigma. So one thing that you can compute is the density of sigma at P. So for R is equal to 0. So it's just the limit when R tends to 0 of the density. And what you get, in get so by definition, is just the limit when r goes to 0 of theta p of r. And what you see in that case is that this quantity is just so close to, the, uh, to p. What you see is a submanifold with a, it's a tangent plane. 
So in the limit, exactly what you see is just the area of that tangent plane in a small ball of radius r, and you compare it exactly to the same quantity. So at the limit, what you see is just the number one, because you have the sum manifold. In fact, it's not exactly one, because uh, the sum manifold could be just immersed, and maybe you have uh, several sheets in, uh, in the sum manifold at that point p. So what you compute is, in fact, the number of sheets at that point. But in general, it's larger than one. Okay. Okay. So, for example, a minimal uh, sum manifold where you, if you can, are able to prove that uh, theta p of r is less than two, you can be sure that the sum manifold is embedded at the point p. You have only one shape. Okay. So now let me give the proof of this formula. But before, let me make some computation that are useful in the proof and useful uh, for its own. So this is the following proposition. So let sigma. Uh, k inside Rn be minimal. So there is two computations I uh, want to make. Uh, so uh, and fix and let uh, E1 En uh, be an orthonormal. basis of Rn. So the first thing is that if you look at the tangential part of Ei, and you compute the divergence along sigma of this, what you get is 0. The second thing is that if you look at x minus p, and you look at the tangential part of this, and you compute the divergence along sigma of this, it's equal to the dimension k. So let me give the proof of this. So uh, I fix uh, f1 fk, uh, an orthonormal <coughs> frame uh, on sigma. And I want to compute, uh, so maybe I can erase this, the divergence of EI. So the divergence of sigma of Ei, the tangential part, is just the sum over L, uh, J, of nabla Fj Ei Fj. So it's not exactly uh, the formula we, see, we saw yesterday, but uh, it's also true. So we have this. So the thing you can do is uh, just write this as uh, the sum of fj, uh, the derivative with respect to fj of ei fj minus this. Okay, and in order to simplify the computation, I will assume something more there, is that at the point where I make the computation, I assume that 
uh, the frame is parallel. So I assume uh, L is equal to zero at P. So I can always assume this at a fixed point, uh, not P because P is the center is there, but at Q. So, okay, so this term disappears, and I get just the derivative with respect to Fj of Ei Fj. And in fact, I can remove uh, this tangential part there because I make the scalar product with something which is just tangential. Okay. This, so now what I get is just nabla bar fj. So it's not, since I'm in Rn, I use d, ei fj plus ei d fj fj. Okay, so EI is a parallel vector in Rn, so this quantity is equal to zero. And here what I see is just uh, EI times K times the mean curvature of the manifold, the submanifold. Because uh, here uh, I have a tangential part and a an, uh, no uh, orthogonal part. The orthogonal part gives me this. The tangential part is equal to zero because of the, the hypothesis I made. Okay. <coughs> okay. So this is equal to zero. So the second ca computation is basically the same. So divergence on sigma of x minus p tangential part, uh, orthogonal uh, tangential part. So it's a sum of nabla f j uh, x minus p f j. So you can do exactly the same computation there and there, and at the end what you get is just the sum on j of d fj x minus p fj plus x minus p k times the mean curvature. The only point where I use something about the fact I made the computation with respect to this vector field, ei, it's just uh, when I say, okay, EI is a, a parallel vector field in Rn. So it's the only point. So I can arrive exactly to, to the same result there. So this is equal to zero. And the derivative of the vector field X minus P in Rn is just Fj. When I do the derivative with respect to Fj. So what I see is just the sum on J of Fj scalar Fj. So it gives me... OK? OK. So some consequence of just of this computation, because they are interesting uh, on their own, is that uh, the first corollary of uh, this computation, in fact, of the, of the first one, is that if sigma is minimal, in Rn, then the coordinate function are, are harmonic. Indeed. 
the gradient along sigma of uh, the, the coordinate function xi is just this vector. So the divergence of, this, of the gradient is equal to zero, so the, the, the coordinate function is harmonic. Okay, so this is a, a first consequence. A second one, which is in fact a consequence of uh, this corollary, is the following. Okay, so if uh, uh, sigma is minimal, is compact, and minimal in Rn, and the boundary of, C, of sigma is contained in some C, uh, where C is convex, then sigma is contained in C. So you have some convex Hull property for a minimal submanifold. A minimal submanifold which is compact is in the convex Hull of its boundary. And how you prove this from this? You say, okay, this convex C is just the intersection of a lot of half space uh, in Rn. So you fix some of this half space. It's uh, just given by the fact that some coordinate function is less than zero. So you, have, you look at this coordinate function on sigma. On the boundary of sigma, this coordinate function is less than zero. It's harmonic, so by the maximum principle, the wool harmonic function is less than zero. Okay? So starting from this, you get this second property. Okay. So now let me give the proof of the uh, formula above. So proof. of the monotonicity formula. So you start with the second uh, computation I make in the, in the proposition there. So you start with the fact that k times the volume of sigma inside the ball uh, of radius uh, r centered at p is just given by the integration on this submanifold of the divergence of x minus p, the divergence of sigma of this. So you use the, that this quantity is equal to k. And you apply Stokes' formula. So this is just by the thing is just the integral over sigma uh, on the, so it's r there and p there. On the sphere of radius r centered at p of x minus p tangential part scalar, scalar the unit outgoing, uh, outward pointing unit normal. Okay, so this gives you a first expression of the volume of sigma inside the ball of radius k. Uh, maybe I will keep this. Uh, so uh, I will denote d, uh, uh, this quantity, so the, di the distance from, uh, to the, the, from the point x to the point p by d. So this gives me a uh, function, a Lipschitz function, and I will 
make the following computation. So the volume, uh, so I will denote this uh, V of R. So the volume of sigma inside the ball of radius R is just, so it's the integral of the constant function equal to 1. And this constant function equal to 1, I will denote it as the quotient of the gradient of the function d divided by, uh, its, uh, by itself. So on sigma intersected with the ball of radius r. OK? OK, and now the idea is to apply the co-area formula in order to compute this quantity as the integral from 0 to r and the integral on sigma intersected with the sphere of radius t of radius t of 1 of this quantity. So here you have to integrate, uh, so I will denote this by t sigma sub t on this uh, sphere. Well, it's not a sphere, but uh, the intersection with the sphere of sigma. Then you integrate over t. So this is the co-area formula. So you have this expression, and the thing is that uh, now, from this, what you get is that the derivative of the volume with r is just given by the integral on sigma intersected with the sphere of 1 over the gradient <coughs> on sigma d, d sigma t. Uh, it's not T, it's R. OK. So you want to compute the difference of two terms of the same function at uh, T and S. So basically, the idea is to compute the derivative of it, then integrate. So you look at the derivative of v of r divided by, by r to the k. Uh, so if I want to have it in the right sense, v prime of r of r to the k minus k v to the r, r to the k plus 1. OK. And I, now I use the two expressions I get. So for v prime, I get this one. And for v of r, I use the one I write here. OK? <coughs> so what I get is just 1 over a of k, uh, the integral of sigma with the sphere of radius r of this quantity, d sigma r minus k r to the k plus 1, the integral over the same thing of this quantity. So it's x minus p, the tangential part, nu. OK. Uh, no, uh, there is no more k. It's k times the volume, which is equal to this. OK. So now let me uh, have a look to this quantity and this quantity. In fact, d is just uh, this quantity. And uh, if you make the computation of what is uh, uh, x, minus p in the scalar product with nu, uh, which is exactly the same as this, since uh, this is tangent to sigma. Then what you get is just the norm of x minus p 
times x minus p divided by x minus p. That are new. And this is exactly the gradient inside Rn of the distance function. So this is tangent to sigma. So in fact, what you get is just x minus p times the grade to this quantity. And here I use the fact that nu is orthogonal to sr. And sr is precisely uh, the, uh, the set of points where the, the function d is constant. So this is orthogonal, also, uh, so it's orthogonal to SR. This is, new is also, uh, is the, no, sorry. New is not orthogonal to SR. It's orthogonal inside sigma to uh, this intersection. And so you have this equality there. And so it's also equal to this. So you put this computation inside this formula, and what you get is that the derivative of vr over r to the k is equal to, so you can put 1 over a r to the k in front of it. So there is 1 over the gradient of sigma sub d sigma intersected with sr minus, and what you get uh, from this formula there, so, so what is exactly the, the expression? So there with this, equal to with this, one minus the gradient of sigma. So, so what you get is 1 over sigma, okay, uh, so you have the gradient on sigma sub d, 1 minus to the square, and there is 1 over r to the k in front of it, okay. Okay, you have this. So this is equal to 1 over r to the k, an integral on sigma intersected with sr. Uh, so there is 1 over the gradient on sigma d. So you will still apply uh, this uh, formula there in order to, uh, to use the expression of this quantity there. And what you get is ju it's just 1 minus x minus p, the tangential part, divided by x minus p to the square, this expression. So I use that uh, uh, this norm is equal to this divided by this. OK. So it's just 1 over r to the k. The integral of sigma, sr, uh, and what you get is x minus p square. And on top, what you get is uh, the norm of x minus p square minus the norm of the tangential part square. So by Pythagore, it's just x minus p, the orthogonal part square. Uh, 1 minus the gradient of sigma sub d. OK, and so it's just x minus p, the orthogonal part, square, divided by x minus p to the k plus 2, because r is just x minus p in, in norm, 1 over the gradient of sigma. OK. So you have computed the derivative of the ratio 
volume of R divided by R to the K. So if you want to have the formula there, you have just to integrate this. So uh, V of R, uh, V of T over T to the K minus V of S, S to the K is just the integral from S to T of this quantity, X minus P square over X minus P uh, to the K plus 2. So here it's D sigma sub R, uh, the gradient of sigma D. Here it's on sigma this, the R. And again, by the co area formula, you get exactly what you want. It's this. It's on the integral on sigma intersected with bt minus bs of x minus p, the orthogonal part, square over x minus p to the k plus 2 d vol on sigma. OK. So you have this uh, result. And this result is, in some sense, uh, the basic tool in order to understand the regularity theory of minimal submanifold. I won't speak about regularity in these lectures, but this is really the basic tool. OK. And now, in order to finish uh, these lectures today, I want to say something about OK. This is, a, you have this nice formula uh, inside Rn, but what about a manifold, a Riemannian manifold? What you get in that case? So in that case, uh, in some sense, you can do a similar computation, but uh, of course, it's not as precise as it is there. Because it's based on the fact that you can control exactly uh, several terms, but uh, you can control the divergence of uh, x minus p. And you have an explicit expression, you know, okay, it's equal to k, and you can use it in order to make some computation. Okay. So what about a Riemannian manifold? So now uh, sigma sub k, uh, sigma k, is inside some Riemannian manifold mn. And you want to prove something which is similar to this. So what you get, in fact, is the following. So you take some point p inside mn. And you look at a geodesic ball, BR of P, a geodesic ball around P. And in fact, you choose R less than uh, some R naught, which is less than the injectivity radius. Uh, of uh, m at p. And you do this in order to have good normal coordinates around that point p. So you can choose uh, uh, these uh, normal coordinates. And the thing is that uh, inside uh, this ball, you have a well-defined uh, distance function. You like look at d, which is the distance from a point uh, Q, so it's D of Q to the point P. So uh, this is a nice, uh, well-defined distance function uh, on, on that ball. And you look at the vector field X, which is just D times the gradient of D. And this gradient in Rn is just X minus P, the point where you are minus P. It's just exactly this. And the thing is that, uh, of, in fact, what you can do 
uh, you can make some computation about this. And what you prove is that uh, the divergence of the tangential part of x on sigma, so of course sigma is, uh, is minimal there, is equal to k. So this is the Euclidean case. But you have uh, some co error term. But this error term, you can control them uh, as a big O of the distance square. And in some sense, what you can do now is, is do exactly the same computation as before, but using that uh, you don't have an exact expression for the divergence, but uh, you have an error term. And you do this exactly more or less the same. And what you get at the end is the following result. Uh, there is some C. Positive. And in some sense, it's the C that appears in this big O there. Such that if you look at the volume of sigma inside the ball of radius r center that p divided by r to the k, and you put an omega k uh, in front in order to have something which is much more convenient. So a priori, this in rn is non-decreasing. In the general case, what you have to add is the following quantity in front of it. It's an exponential term there, like this. So this quantity is non-decreasing. For r less than r naught. OK, and in fact, in some sense, uh, this constant c can be given uh, by the geometry of the geodesic, uh, of the geodesic ball there. If you have some control on the curvature, you can expect to have some control on the constant c. But in general, uh, OK, you have a constant c. So it seems uh, not very uh, useful to have this expression because uh, this quantity can grow very fast. And so, OK, it's normal that this, it is non-decreasing. But there is at least one thing which is interesting, is that you can still take the limit when r goes to 0. And uh, when r goes to 0, this just gives you 1. So the limit when r goes to 0 is exactly the same as the, the Euclidean case. So get some information like this. One other information that you can have in that situation is the following. OK, uh, if M is compact, uh, one thing that you can do is uh, you can choose R0 and uh, C uniformly. So in order that R0 and C works for any point P. So what you get is that, uh, and this is the uh, corollary of uh, the monotonicity formula in that general case, is that uh, if M is uh, compact, uh, of course, when I say compact there, is uh, without boundary. Okay, so you have this. There is some delta positive such that for any minimal sig sigma minimal and boundary of sigma. Uh, is empty also. So I fix the ambient manifold and I choose inside it some sigma which is minimal. Then what you get from this is that the area, the volume of sigma is at least delta. So inside M you can't have a very, very small minimal submanifold. It has to have some volume. 
And why this is true? It's the following fact. So you choose R0 and C uniformly. And what you see is that uh, this quantity, <coughs> so the volume of sigma inside the ball of radius R0 at P, uh, divided by R0 to the K, is larger than the limit of this when R0 goes to 0. Okay? And if I choose P inside sigma, it's larger than 1. If P is inside K and is inside sigma. OK. So it tells me that the volume of sigma is larger than the volume of sigma inside the ball of radius R0, centered at P. And this is larger than e to the minus c r0, r0 to the k. And this is a constant that does not depend on the point p. So this is exactly the del delta I want to uh, take. OK? So OK. So just uh, before finishing the lecture, I will give you uh, two exercises. Uh, but they are not so easy to handle. So. It's not so easy to find uh, the proof of this with uh, the tool I gave uh, today. In fact, you have to improve a bit the, the tool I give today. Uh, so the exercises are the following. OK, so uh, it's concern uh, minimal submanifold. OK, uh, on va look at minimal surface in, a, in the unit 3 sphere. So uh, object of dimension 2 inside the unit 3 sphere. So uh, the first question is the following. Let sigma be uh, closed, so compact, without boundary, minimal surface in the unit 3 sphere, and prove the following. Prove that the area of sigma is larger than the area of the unit 2 sphere. So the unit 2 sphere uh, can be seen as an equator <coughs> of the unit 3 sphere. OK? So uh, in some sense, uh, uh, this minimal surface, in fact, totally geodesic uh, surface, has least area among any minimal surface inside the unit 3 sphere. The second question is the following. So it's exactly the same beginning. And prove that if sigma has area less than twice, uh, so strictly less than twice, the area of the equator, then it is embedded. A priori, I do not assume that sigma is embedded uh, in uh, the, the, these two st statements. Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs>